Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Pierre. Um, so I'm the head of the big data for the, for the public television here in Belgium. I'm also the chairman of the big data strategy committee for the European Broadcasting Union. So I don't know whether some of you come from abroad, but if you come from Europe, from the Middle East, or even from Russia, uh, you are all members of the uh, European Broadcasting Union. And uh, I'm leading uh, the adventure, the big data adventure for uh, all European broadcasters, 73 uh, organizations. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how we started a project a year and a half ago with uh, no money. Uh, we were two on the team. We had a budget of like 100,000 euros to get a 5 million euro project that we started on the 14th of July 2016 with one vision. And actually, uh, the first customer we onboarded the day before we officially kicked up the project. Uh, the first customer was France Television in France, and uh, I kind of pitched uh, all the broadcasters in the European Union with one vision that we'll present today, and uh, they bought in, and they decided to come with us and to commit to uh, buying uh, all projects that were developed. So I'm not going to talk about virtual reality, which is your stuff. I'm more going to talk about uh, how data influences our lives, what we want to do with data and maybe inspires you for uh, this weekend on how you develop your products. Okay. So I do think that public uh, organizations, which I'm working for, will definitely change the rules of the games, and that's like a mountain because we have a lot to do. And the first thing I would like to address you is how many of you are more than 40? Okay, so there is one old guy just like me here. I turned forward last, uh, last month, and um, well, when I started the internet uh, some 15 years ago, it kind of sounded like this, I don't know whether you remember. That's the sound of the internet like 15 years ago, in 96 the first internet connection that I got was like this. And it actually looked like this. At the internet here, you have Alta Vista, and uh, maybe you were used to communicating on IRC. Yeah, some people are nothing, yeah, because they have to remember some kind of uh, souvenirs and memories. But it was all so fun and so new. Uh, we were communicating with new channels, with new uh, ways, with people we hadn't met before, with people that were far away. Everything was new and was kind of a dream for uh, the people to be able to communicate and to search information uh, in a new way. Today it's all a different matter. Does somebody has an idea how many websites there are? I counted them like 48 hours uh, ago and I can give you the answer, the exact answer. In North Korea I think there are five. <laughs> so what, what do you think? How many websites? 100 million. 100 million. Okay. What do you think? 500 million. 500 million. Okay. So the, that's the number of websites. So we started in 91 with one website. Yeah. And we just reached the 1 billion mark. So there are 1 billion and 40 million websites on Earth. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, but that's also a reflection of uh, how we communicate as a species. Uh, the more websites you have, the more ways you have to communicate. It uh, reflects also uh, how we project ourselves in uh, the, what I call the libertarian dreams. And that's, the websites are a reflection of how we want to communicate and how we want to uh, like spread our ideas. Yeah. What but, happened in 2013? Well, there were two drops. I don't know, maybe uh, okay. I, I have no idea. But I, I was sure that someone would ask the question. But there was a drop of a few. Uh, The problem is how do we organize ourselves with so many websites? Yeah, because they are uh, they have become like unsearchable. Yeah, uh, so it's not like Alta Vista where people were uh, registering and listing all the websites. Today you have uh, search engines, and search engines are actually the first types of recommendation algorithms that were uh, put into place massively. Does everybody know what a recommendation algorithm is? Pretty much, excellent. Okay, so recommendations algorithms, yeah? uh, systems that recommend what you should do or consume or whatever, are pretty old. Actually, the first uh, recommendation algorithm came in 92. It was uh, made by Xerox. It 
was called Tapestry, and the idea was to browse all the news groups at night and deliver new information to, um, to the engineers of Xerox in the morning so that they could learn new things. Again, you had group lengths in 92 and you had movie lengths in 94. And movie lengths is kind of a predecessor of Netflix today because it asked people to rate the movies they were watching in order to recommend them new movies. But nowadays, they are used for a wide range of applications. Actually, you use them all, um, all the day. Yet concerns have emerged about how they influence our lives and how they trap us. Yeah? Because recommendations algorithm kind of recommend you what you should or suggest you what you should uh, consume and actually you buy in. And it fits into a more general debate, and I'm not sure that you are uh, aware of that, as whether we just live in a computer simulation, we just live in a matrix. Some of you are uh, laughing, but that's a real concern that real people are having. Here it's Elon Musk. He said basically there are one chance in a billion that we are not living in a simulation. Here, that's an article in the Scientific American. Are we living in a computer simulation? Two billionaires of the Silicon Valley are funding secretly scientists to escape the matrix. And here, that's a debate that took place at the Planetarium in uh, New York. And to pick up the debate was, is the universe a simulation? And here we have scientists from Harvard, MIT, New York University. So you have kind of the best scientists on Earth, on nuclear physics, on astrophysics, and they all debate on whether we are living in a simulation or not. So that's a real concern that some people, some highly intelligent people, are having. And you may perhaps not be aware of that. So this being said, let's now look at our recommendation algorithms and artificial intelligence is used in our daily lives. Kind of divided the world into two. So here you have your private life and here you have your business life. Yeah, so here it's your home and here it's your office. So first of all, if you look here uh, in the living room, algorithms are used to recommend which ad you will see. So if you live in Belgium and you're using Proximus, uh, some of you may use Proximus to uh, watch TV, well, the advertising is actually tailored to your needs. So if you watch uh, a soccer game, you will see more beer advertising. Well, we are not, aware, we are not allowed in Belgium to, uh, uh, to make advertising for alcohol, but you may see more of, uh, more of that. So your consumption patterns determines what you are seeing. How many of you have Netflix? So, some of you, okay, so everything what you see on your own page is decided by uh, an algorithm. Yeah? And if you consume, if you click on play on your own page, well, actually, you uh, followed the suggestions of uh, the algorithm. Here, in the room, in the sleeping room, here, Coursera, so that's me, that's my profile. You see, I should learn more about Tableau yeah, to visualize the uh, data. Uh, so what to study next is also powered by uh, an algorithm. Here, room to follow, that's also a recommendation algorithm. Here, in the sleeping room, uh, if you want to read a book at night or before sleeping, well, Amazon, the whole business model of Amazon is built on recommendation algorithms. What to read next? And here, that's my Spotify account, what to listen to next, that's also a recommendation algorithm. Let's move to the office. So if you are a recruiter, here what you see is whom you should hire. So you just post an application and here are the profiles that fit your, um, your position. Here, that's a very interesting startup in New York. It's called Stitch It. Uh, you may want to subscribe to a monthly uh, package of uh, clothing and shoes and whatever. You get that at home and then you just send back what you uh, don't want. Well, actually, everything what's in the package is suggested by an algorithm. And it's used by designers, packers within the, um, within the company to pump the clothes and the shoes uh, in the package. And there are many other applications. For instance, uh, insurances use algorithm to select the right and the wrong customers. So if you are rejected, you are likely to have been rejected by an algorithm. Uh, select a customer for mortgages. If you apply for a mortgage uh, in a bank, you will be selected or not uh, by an algorithm. 
uh, your, the price you will pay for an insurance will be determined by an algorithm. And the same for advertising. If you uh, put an, uh, an ad in Facebook, uh, well, the segment you belong to will be determined by a recommendation algorithm. So you see, it's pretty much everywhere. And there are two types of usages that I see. The first one is what I call user-centered usages. So it's B2C. And here we have B2B applications. OK. Let's see one, one example, and it's Netflix. You may not realize it, but when you are on Netflix on your own page, you have 25 algorithms that are uh, kind of suggesting what you should watch next. Yeah. And actually, you have, may have heard also of the Netflix challenge that started in 2006, that ended in 2009, and the winners got $1 million. And yeah, the challenge was, please try to predict what will be consumed next by the Netflix subscribers. Yeah, it took three years to a team to achieve that goal, and they won $1 million. So from 2006 to 2009. What is the result today? 80% of everything that is consumed on Netflix is suggested by an algorithm. 80%. That's a lot. Yeah? And the most successful algorithm, or the most successful um, videos that are watched are those that are here. So it's not very uh, readable, it's continue watching. Actually, Netflix so that people are of a very high likelihood to consume uh, something that they stopped before and they just want to continue. So if you have watched uh, Game of Thrones, uh, season <coughs> two, episode number three, you are highly likely to like uh, number four of the same season. So that's pretty logic. Yeah. How, does it work? How does it work? How the continue watching algorithm work? There are actually three algorithms. The first one determines where the row continue watching will be placed. Should it be number one, should it be number two, or should it be number three, or even below? Okay, so that's the, the vertical position of the row. Number two determines the ranking of the movies within the row. And the third algorithm, believe it or not, determines the picture that will, the vignette, if you, if you like, uh, that will illustrate the, the movie. What is the vision of Netflix? Well, that uh, slide I took over from a presentation they gave uh, in Boston uh, six <coughs> weeks ago, and I was there to present our vision. That's a real slide, so I just copied paste. And what does uh, Netflix want? They want you to turn on the TV and do nothing, and then it will just start playing. And you will watch what the algorithm has selected for you. Yeah, so it's very, very automated. So, is it good? Is it not good? I, I don't know. I just leave you with that, uh, with that quote, which I think is very inspiring. Yeah. And why do they want to do that? Because they have only one KPI that they want to reach. It's user retention. It's loyalty. They don't care about the rest. They just want to make sure that their subscribers subscribe again, that they do not stop terminate their contract after the end of the month. And actually it works because 80% of everything that is consumed, as I said, is suggested by algorithms. So we are just like sheep. We follow instructions of the machine. So there is an ethical problem. I met with this guy. It's Neil Hunt. It's the chief product officer of Netflix. That's a guy who decides whether or not new features will be uh, uh, going into production. And he said this at the Rexis conference keynote in 2014. The Rexis recommendation system uh, conference is the biggest conference on earth in terms of uh, recommendation algorithm. And he said, Netflix metrics cannot distinguish between an enriched life and addiction. So I repeat, because this is very important. It cannot distinguish between an enriched life and addiction. So this guy admits that there is an ethical problem in all what he's doing. He's not sure that what he's delivering to his customers will actually make them better citizens, um, that it creates value for them. It may actually create addicted consumers. As for yourself, if you consume 10 hours of Netflix videos per day, does it make you a better citizen? Does it make you a better person? Or does it make you a junkie? That's a question. OK. So we just keep that in mind, and we move to the second use case. Insurance. Does someone work for insurances here? 
Nobody works for insurances, I just hate insurances and banks, by the way. So two sectors for which I will never work. All right. So one product of insurances is your car insurance, all right? So that's, there are two very big sectors, two very big products that generate profits for insurances. It's life insurance and it's car insurance. So this person here has a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I designed a presentation, so I knew what I wanted to do. If you want to pay less for insurance, you may change insurances and well, kind of play with the competition, or you can um, adhere to a scheme which is called uh, pay uh, for your own behavior. Yeah? So it's um, depending on your own behavior. The price that you pay depends on how you drive. Telematics. Sorry? So telematics. Exactly, exactly. So telematic is one way to track user behavior, but here you see that's an application that's uh, from Aviva in, uh, in the UK, uh, and it tracks actually how you drive, how you accelerate, how you decelerate, how fast you drive, uh, whether you are a good driver or not. Yeah? And depending on that, it proposes you a, bet, a better price, or not, or it increases your premium. Okay. The problem is, the precision is not sufficient, so they tried or they started uh, introducing the telematic index that you were talking about. Small black boxes, big like this, that they put in the, in the car and they are linked to satellites with a high precision and they will tell you whether or not you drive well. So the precision is thought to increase actually the prediction of whether or not you are a good driver. Okay. The problem is the precision is actually very bad and I talked to uh, insurances um, throughout the year 2016. And they all said, well, all the experiments that we started prove that we cannot predict whether you will be a good driver or not. So I cannot say that. I see, I observe that you are driving, that you are decelerating, but I don't know whether or not you will uh, cause an accident. That's impossible, even with the telematic units. That's why I'm saying this is only a marketing tool. Yeah. So in other terms, in statistical terms, uh, the data that are captured by either the black boxes or the mobile applications are not sufficient to explain the variance and to predict the variance of the driving behavior. So what do we do? Well, they have a solution. They have a solution, believe me or not. And the solution is here. They want actually to access what's in your body. Heartbeats, pressure, blood pressure, that kind of things. Oh, are you reluctant? Uh, more than yes. More than yes. Well, actually, some people are already giving that information without knowing. You know why? Because they have debt on their wrist. And if you have a Fitbit, if you have a smartwatch, there are good chances, good odds that it's actually linked to your Facebook account. So I proved it in 2015. I wrote an article and I showed that people actually published their health data on the internet. They became public. And there was a very interesting article uh, earlier this year in the Scientist, American Scientist, which showed that if you follow someone's blood pressure or heartbeats a long time, like six months, you can actually uh, find correlations on whether or not he's in good health. So just following up what uh, the heartbeats or performances of your uh, friends on Facebook is sufficient to uh, determine whether or not they should be allowed to subscribe an insurance. And it's actually what happens. First example, CSS in Switzerland, that's what they propose. Regular exercise is important for healthy living. My step from CSS insurance will motivate you to get more exercise. Insured persons with a CSS health account are rewarded for every additional step they take during the day. If you have a step counter, you can synchronize your daily number of steps online with MyStep. By getting sufficient exercise, you will earn credits in your MyStep account. Your MyCSS client login portal keeps track of your daily steps and sends you a monthly email showing you the progress you've made. We urge you to use every opportunity during the day to get some exercise. For example, by taking the stairs instead of the elevator getting off the bus one stop earlier, taking hikes, or going shopping on foot. Doing so makes you eligible for monthly compensation in your CSS health account, and you become more aware of your exercise habits. 
and the benefits of leading a healthy life. By the way, the more you exercise, the larger your compensation. Take the first step. You can find further detail. Okay, I said there. Um, so here, the premise is you will kind of get savings if you agree for wearing a watch and giving your data to the insurance. Okay, it sounds like a good deal. Now, well, actually, that's only the first step because if you believe them, they will access that data to do much more than what they say they will do. Yeah, so that's only the first step into some more invasive and intrusive uh, data collection processes. So that exists, and that's only uh, live from September 2016, so that's very fresh. But you see, that's come. So four key takeaways. Your body is the last frontier in data collection, and it's about to be crossed. So there are examples in the market that show that people are willing, under some false uh, premises, to give access to their body. I think that is very worrying. Second key takeaway here, the premise is intrusiveness, data collection processes versus savings, financial savings. Third, what I do believe is that wearables will become the norm, not the exception. So if you agree today, yeah, that's the exception, but in like two, three, four years, if we do not rule against something like this, that will become the norm and you will be penalized if you don't wear a wearable. So will, you will have to pay a premium if you don't want to be tracked. Yeah. And the, third, the, the fourth takeaway, and the most uh, worrying one, is that kind of trend opens the door for something which is a uh, dramatic disruption to, uh, to our ecosystem. That's the principle of solidarity, mutual risk sharing. That's the principle of insurance in Europe since hundreds of years, dozens of years. So if we let do that, what will happen is that you will pay for your own risk, like in the US, like in the UK. Perhaps Canada, I don't know the use case enough. But do you want to pay for your own risk? Because you inherited the genetics of your parents, will you pay for that? You can change your driving behavior, you cannot change your genetics. Remember that. Okay. So that was the vision that I saw like a year and a half ago to many broadcasters and I said we have to do something to make better recommender systems. We are public organizations, we want to do something good for the society, we have to change the way we design our recommender systems and everything must be for the profit of our uh, users. And if you look at the 25 past years of recommender system, you see that trend. We went from very simple uh, models, yeah, what we call the collaborative filtering, to very complex user-based personalization model, deep learning. You heard a few months ago that uh, a computer won against the world champion of uh, the Go game, the game of Go. Yeah, that was deep learning algorithm, right? Random forest deep learning algorithm. Okay, second, we went from explicit data, so you declared something, 25 years ago, you had the intention of doing something, and what we collect today are implicit feedback. So 25 years ago, I let you fill in surveys to understand how you would behave, and today what I'm collecting is implicit data, the pages that you are visiting, the movements of your mouse, everything what you do online is collected. And I do that too, yeah, on my websites, I do that too three million uh, times a day, because I have three million visitors a day. So that's what I do, I play. Okay, we went from not intrusive data collection process, choice-based, so you had the choice to answer, to give your data, to give your opinion or not, to something which is intrusive. Today, what do you do if you do not want your data to be collected online? You have to go in your brother setting, you have to uh, cancel some settings, you have to change everything. I mean. 99% of people here in Belgium, they are not aware of that and they are not able to change that. Let's face the reality. So is that fair? I don't know. We had a higher serendipity potential 25 years ago because there were less websites. So you were 
more likely to come across an interesting information, interesting piece of information that made sense for you. That's sort of like when you read a journal 25 years ago, there was perhaps one article that you wanted to read in the journal, in the paper uh, journal, but you browsed all the pages and suddenly you came across something which was new for you and which made you richer intellectually. Today, there is less serendipity. And there is less serendipity because we are trapped in two types of bubbles. Two types of bubbles. The first one, first one is what we call the filter bubble. When you search online, the results that you are uh, suggested to browse are recommended by an algorithm. 98% of people do not go beyond page two on Facebook. Sorry, beyond uh, page one. So the 10 results that are shown on page one of, of Google, is that relevant? And what about the dozens of thousands of other results that may be also relevant for you? You do not see them. So that's what was called the filter bubble, because you are trapped in a bubble. The filter is the algorithm, and the algorithm traps you in a bubble that you are unable to escape. And the trap number two is what I call the ecosystem trap. When you use Google products, it's not about uh, the search engine. It's about Waze, it's about Google News, it's about uh, all the other websites and all the other companies that have built around the Google brand. If you are using them, you're actually making your life as a whole trackable and predictable. Is that what you want? I don't know. But when I explained this one a half year ago, organization and public sector said, yes, we have to do something against that. And when I spoke six weeks ago to Coursera, LinkedIn, Netflix, Spotify, they told me, well, what you are trying to address is a very important problem. We are not allowed to address it because we have financial KPIs to reach, but that's a very important problem. So we went in 25 years from the measurement of intended behaviors to observed behaviors. And there was a gap. There is a real gap between that. If there were no gap, what would be the consequence? The consequence is that there would be no one consuming that kind of video. It's 100 million views on YouTube. 100 million views. So who would declare 25 years ago that he wants to consume that kind of shit? Nobody, nobody. So that's the difference between intention and observation. Okay. We want, with our project, to <coughs> just break away from that and create new hope, create new freedom for people. And I think that public service media, so PSM in short, they can do that. We can do that because we have, or we must do that because we have three challenges. The challenge number one, that's that young boy here, Behaviors and expectations of the 12-24 segment are changing and we cannot ignore it. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, Netflix will kind of uh, grab our market share. 50% of the 12-29 segment gets uh, informed online, yeah? which is, I think, the case with all of you here. And 26% of the 12-24 segment gets informed only through Twitter and Facebook. Wow. Second challenge, we have, to put back, we have to put the user back at the center, but nobody's there. We have to rethink the value for user proposal, yeah, which is forbidden or forgotten by, uh, by everyone. We can promote what we call positive biases, uh, so it means we can promote or try to promote uh, some business rules that will force you to see new content. And we do not want to enslave the user. That's challenge number three. And the challenge number three is to break away from the social media. Who is not using Facebook here? Not using. You are not using Facebook. So we have three people here um, from the older generation, above 40. Okay, which is good. Yeah. Uh, we are not using Facebook. Well, actually, do you think Facebook shows you everything what your friends post online? No. You say no, you say no. Okay, you are pretty old. I think you are. We have all studies, so we are not all intelligent people. 
Well, actually, you are not the norm because 62.5% of Facebook users ignore that a study from 2015 that there is an algorithm that curates what you see in your newsfeed. And statistics show that if you have 200 friends, uploads and coming, uh, you will see only between 10 and 20% of the content which is posted by your friend. So 80% will just disappear. And even more, more worrying is studies that show that you adapt your behaviors to what the algorithm expects from you. Just like in a Pavlov, Pavlovian experiment. Remember the Pavlov experiment? Just, just like this. Here you expect something from the algorithm and subjectively, without knowing, you adapt your behavior to get your daily dose of algorithm. So we have to change all that and there are some questions that we're asking yourself is how to enrich lives, how to break away from social media, and how to enrich taste. How do you make someone uh, who likes only sport to like also culture, uh, cultural things? And I think you guys in the virtual reality world, you have also something to, uh, to bring to that. Yeah? Because you propose new experiments and maybe you can uh, expose people to new type of contents, to a new type of experiments that will help them extend their taste. But that's crucial. And the third case question is, do we have to make lives easier? Because that's really what recommendations algorithms do, make lives easier. Well, sometimes we'll learn also from failures. When you learn walking, that's not because you fall 100, 200, 300 times that you say, well, that's not for me, I will, I will not try walking. And if you think for yourself, maybe the most valuable experiments, experiences that you have made in your life are those that were the most difficult ones. You were faced with a challenge, you solved that challenge, and you learned something, and you keep memories of that challenge for the, world, for the rest of your life. How do we want to do that? Well, before giving you the answers, some three essential questions that I wanted to remember. So are we still free or are we just like simulated? Am I real or am I just an algorithm and, and we are all in the matrix and everything is uh, it's not, not true, perhaps. Yeah. Are our behaviors dictated by algorithms? And how can we achieve the original liberatory dream? How can we make sure that people discover new things, that they are free, that we uh, start sharing with each other uh, once again. Well, just going back to the second question, are we following algorithms and instructions? That is me, if you don't remember, if you don't uh, remember, that's me. Uh, last week I was discussing with this guy. This guy is Max Schrems, I don't know whether you know it. It's a hero for all data freaks. That's the guy who won his trial against Facebook. And he changes all the, the legal aspects of data collection, data analysis in Europe. So if you are protected today in Europe, you have made out of safe harbor, that's because of him. Because he started the trial against Facebook and he won it in Ireland a few years ago. And he said, well, a friend of him was not aware of the Brexit because he was getting from only on Facebook. And the correction algorithm of Facebook decided that it was not uh, sufficiently interesting for him to know about the Brexit. Wow. So here's the plan. And here is the plan that we try to realize in our company. And it's called E3. Wow. That's a great name. It's educate, excite, encourage. And it's a virtual server. I give you three examples of how we do that, of how, what we are developing to achieve that. So educate, what we want to educate people, well, uh, we want to educate them by proposing them new content, uh, so explore in the width new content, we want to educate them by deepening their knowledge, but we want also to educate them by showing what algorithms do in our daily lives. I think that's something which is incredible, we are surrounded by artificial intelligence, and people do not know how to code. So they do not understand uh, computers. They do not understand uh, coding mechanisms. So we want to show that. How do we do that? What, what, what we are developing right now is a slider. So imagine you are on your um, Netflix homepage, and this slider 
moved from left to right decides on the level of personalization. So on the left you get no personalization, on the right you get 100% personalization. So you see visually, and that's I think the interesting part on the interesting bridge to virtual reality, you see visually the effect of algorithms. Okay. And then you decide for yourself whether or not you want to uh, get more personalization and explore new content. But you are in the driver's seat and you decide yourself. Encourage? Well, our goals as a public organization is to encourage diversity, debate, and engagement of people within the society, make them better citizens, um, avoid uh, ghettoization. And we decided not only to uh, recommend online resources, but also offline. Yeah, so we have a company which is called Milia Belge, Milia Une Passion, where we um, kind of try to promote a real experience, real life uh, sharing of people. If you have a passion, if you are good at gardening, for instance, <coughs> you can use that platform to share your knowledge of gardening and invite other people to share your knowledge with you. So that's a real event. And we organize 1,000 events a year. We come across 2 million people every single year. And we think that we should not only recommend, as I said, online uh, things, but also offline things. Excite? Well, we have to promote curiosity, promote interactions, leverage emotions. Yeah? And what we uh, are trying to do right now is to visualize the context of recommendations. Like this. So when you, when you get recommendations, normally you just get one, uh, one picture with one tile or subtitle, and you decide whether or not to uh, click on it and to consume the, the content. What we're trying to do right now is to put everything in context. So you consumed that video, for instance, we explain you the relationships between the different recommendations that you are making and what you just consumed. So here is a video it's a, about um, the closure of the Montgomery uh, tunnel uh, that you may have heard about. And we propose, well, an historical perspective on uh, mobility, on, on tunnels here in, uh, in Brussels, on the mobility in, um, in the Brussels regions. But we propose also other uh, topics that are linked uh, to the closure of this tunnel. We propose the Stephanie tunnel closure. We propose a topic on um, structural, uh, uh, how do you call that, jams that happens in, uh, in Brussels. The role of uh, companies car on the province of mobility. So we put everything back in context so that people buy in and understand visually why we make a recommendation. Yeah? And I think that's also some, someone came to me this morning from, uh, from, your, um, from the academy and said, we have the idea to visualize uh, data. And I think that's, that's a very interesting process because the brain, currently the brain of people is so much overloaded that we have to find other ways to help the brain cope with that amount of information. And visualization is something which is great. Mind mapping is something which is really powerful if you want to do that. Okay, so there is hope. We are trying to uh, bring that hope forward and to make it real. As I said, uh, we got the first customer for our project before we officially uh, kicked it off. Um, so France Television in France uh, bought the project or uh, bought in uh, on uh, Thursday. RTV in Spain uh, decided to uh, onboard with us. Um, if there are so many uh, Austrian people here in the, in the room, RAF contacted me yesterday to join the project. So there is a whole um, well, list of uh, broadcasters, international broadcasters, that are actually joining us and that share that vision. So there is hope. And I start with one quote by Pablo Picasso. Yeah, you all know it. Computers are useless. They can only give you answers. Yeah. I think they are indeed useless. I mean, that's the limit of artificial intelligence. We can only get correlations. And why do we get only correlations? Because algorithms are based on your past behavior to predict your future behavior. I mean, that's also an ethical problem. I mean, if you, if you buy in, if you always follow the suggestion, it means that you are entering a vicious circle where you just kind of promote your past behaviors over and over again. Yeah. 
belt. The good news is there is no perfect model. I was at Deleuze yesterday. You know, we all know Deleuze. And they can only explain like 50, 60% of the behaviors. Yeah? So there is 40% of the behaviors that remain like fuzzy or unpredictable. And that's the part of humanity that we have in all of this. Yeah? That's the part of creativity that we have in all of this. And that's what computers are not good at, creativity. Yeah? There is no computer that could have come up with uh, the Einstein's uh, ideas. That's impossible. <coughs> Einstein was unique. He was not a computer and he made some connection in his brain that computers are unable to, to make and that's how we made uh, the progresses that we made. But let's face it, the world is about to be disrupted by artificial intelligence and the jobs of today are not going to exist tomorrow. So we have to find a way to cope with that artificial intelligence. We have to find a way to rethink the jobs that we do and to well, kind of coexist with the cognitive machines. And perhaps they will free up some uh, time for us to focus on creativity, to uh, focus on finding new ideas and finding uh, new solutions to the problem that we, uh, that we have. I need to take a picture of that because it's also cool. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Um, so if you want to continue uh, discussing, debating with me um, on uh, Tuesday, I'm in Helsinki. I don't know if there was any Finnish people here. Uh, I will be in Paris on the 15th of uh, November. I will be at the Data Summit. I will be speaking at the Data Summit on the 25th of November. And if you want just to follow me online, uh, so LinkedIn is a good way, or uh, have a blog where I publish three times uh, a week in French, English, and Dutch. Everything is translated, not by machine, by real human. <laughs> so if you want just to follow me, you are welcome. Mm -hmm. Just drop me in. Thank you so much for it. Questions, answers, comments, answers. Is it a bit the same that you're doing like uh, open intelligence? Open intelligence is, uh, what do you call open intelligence? Open Explain intelligence us. is a company started by the human intelligence. We study artificial intelligence. We look at the it's disruptive. Uh, well, I don't know that company, uh, unfortunately, but I know there are some other initiatives in the commercial sectors that uh, try to do the same. We are kind of limited to uh, media consumption and to the public sector, but perhaps that's the same. I mean, Elon Musk is also aware of the problems of artificial intelligence and uh, he's a thinker. He tries to think, uh, to think forward, so maybe that's uh, indeed something, uh, something similar, but I will, I will check that. Thank you for mentioning that. I don't know if you have too much relation, but um, I was thinking that it's really necessary as far as the mention of education. When the last times that we have the society voting and it's something that is their own decision, the decisions are not so clever, let's say. Then having people voting for Brexit, having people voting for against peace in yep. uh, Colombia, having so many supporters in uh, Trump. That's uh, something that clever person, or uh, let's say somebody that uh, I am not some I'm something against all the people that support it, but okay, they are free to choose, but it, it sounds like not evolution, let's say, it not sounds clever. I think that's a great question. Uh, the Brexit has been shown, has been caused by people uh, who have polarized views and false views on what it was and the decisions that were taken were uh, kind of erroneous. But all the decisions were taken based on information that people got online, on Facebook, and everything that is behind the information that they um, kind of consumed was decided by algorithms. So it has been shown also that on Facebook, if you consume uh, uh, right views, so Democrat views, you will get more Democrat news. Uh, if you are Republican, you will get more. So everything, that's what we call the balkanization of the web. So it's, everything is polarized. And you are not able to change your judgment by uh, being faced, confronted with uh, the opposite views. And that's, that's the problem. And that's why we want to fight. That's exactly that problem that we want to fight. Uh, I saw uh, a study where some researchers showed that it was extremely easy 
to change people's voting preferences without them even noticing it uh, on social media. Um, do you think that actually happens? Like, do you think that some people are manipulating it? Oh. Evil intent. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah. Like you understand that the banks are doing it, yeah. Uh, but you know they're a bank. You know they take your money. But do you think other people are doing it? <coughs> and how 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 widespread would you think that? Well, it's it's true that well commercial entities are uh, nudging, are using nudges to yeah. influence our people or behavior. Yeah. Mm. And so the uh, opting opt out, for instance, is a famous uh, way to uh, to change the behavior. Whether or not some um, intelligences, secret intelligences, are manipulating us, this, this I don't know. But you understand that if you are Facebook today, if you are less, well, less Twitter, but let's take the example of Facebook or Google. If you are Facebook or Google, um, if you have access to your algorithm and if you can change it, manipulate it, then you can obviously change the way people are uh, faced with the reality. Because the reality is not what we are experiencing today, that's not that anymore. The reality for most of us is behind a smartphone or uh, behind a computer, but it's less and less uh, made of uh, real interactions like we are having today, if you are not simulated, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so but this, I, cannot, I cannot answer, but you understand that there, there, is, a, there is a possibility, there is a, a probability that some evil people can do it. Whether they take the chance to do it or not, this I cannot answer. But, but it's is, possible. Is that something you're looking at to maybe detect when that's going on? That there is no way that you can detect because you have no access to the um, to the algorithm. Yeah? And that's what actually made me think of uh, something which is very important too. Thank you for uh, not asking me, but thank you for making it there. Uh, um, a few months ago, I wrote an article for uh, the European Broadcasting Union called Open the Models. And um, my um, argument was that we have to make people aware of which variables we use in our algorithms to produce one uh, response, one answer. Today, Facebook is not telling you and will never tell you how uh, things are appearing on your newsfeed. That's their secret. Google the same, eh? the Panda or mm -hmm. algorithm, or that kind of thing. Like, all people try to figure out how to come first, but that's the secret, that's a trade secret. We are saying we want to open the models and we want to explain everyone how we want to do it. And actually, on the 1st of December 2016, look at what will happen on our TBF websites. We will explain people what we will be doing, how we will collect their data, what we will be doing with it, and how they can get rid of personalization if, you want, uh, if they want to get their freedom again. We are going one step forward. Uh, in explaining, in opening everything to the people to change the way algorithms are perceived in our society. So we have really to explain people and make everything visible and transparent for the society. You had a question? And you had a question? Does it answer your question first? Yes. It does. Okay, great. No, uh, it's not a question, it was a comment. I okay, think great. That, uh, if you show the algorithm on Facebook or Google, to break their business model. Yeah, of course. So they will never, they will never. Mind. They will never, they will never do it. But there is a more paramount, central problem to that. Uh, Facebook defines itself. Uh, when you look uh, the corporations, um, well, uh, uh, governance rules of Facebook, they define themselves as a platform. But what we are observing today is it's not a platform anymore. Google, Facebook are medias, like we are, like all televisions are, but they are not admitting it. And if you are a media, you are not allowed to cheat on your algorithms, you are not to, uh, allowed to uh, trick your algorithm because you have to reflect the diversity of the society, you have to deflect, reflect the, the diversity of opinions. So there is a huge conflict that people are not aware about between the real Definition how Facebook is defining themselves and what they are doing in actuality. You see? But could, could you use that to say, all right, Facebook, you're not a community anymore, you're doing stuff that media does? Couldn't that argument be used to hold them well, back? Facebook, or? Facebook are like uh, 4,000 trials uh, ongoing right now. Uh, we 
as the European Broadcasting Union, we also try to influence that. Yeah? Uh, so we, we have a uh, legal team, we try to enforce um, everything what we, what we can. The problem is Facebook is based in, uh, in California and we are based in European Union, so the, that's difficult to make things advance. But uh, the solution that we want to uh, implement is to make people aware. If people become aware of what is going on, then they may change. Yeah? And today, 15% of my traffic is coming from Facebook. So I have to take very hard decisions. I have to, to change the rules of the game if I do not want to depend on Facebook even more. Mm. Got it? Mm. Yeah, you had a question? I'm really sure that uh, if you don't offer people another option, another Facebook, then Okay, for example, I know very well all that kind of things, and, uh, but I still continue to use it because I need it. So, what is the solution for producing information? You know, there is still uh, an important part of the of the population that will not buy, and they will just continue consuming uh, what Facebook suggests. But, well, I cannot change the world, the world world in one day. That's impossible. So, I have to start somewhere. And my starting point is the people who care a little bit about how they get uh, informed. People who care about the society, people who care about being better citizens, that's my starting point. Yeah. And maybe that will be the tipping point, I don't know. Yeah, but I have to start somewhere. I cannot target the world population, that's impossible. Because you will always have, and I mean, I don't want to be, um, to be rude, but you will always have lower educated people that do not care about how they get informed or who don't care about uh, being informed. And they will keep reading the news that Facebook suggests. And that's OK. I cannot change that. Do you think, um, like, you can have an algorithm yeah. that could look at your behavior yeah. and tell you when you're being uh, pushed yeah. one way or the other? Would it be possible to have that, like, a cigarette warning label? You're being pushed like this right now. Mm. Wow. Uh, if I had access to the algorithm, I could, could do that. But to uh, be able to do that, I would also have to uh, gather what we call metadata on the content itself. Mm -hmm. So recognize that the content is labeled a certain way and that uh, you are being pushed to that, to that way. Mm -hmm. Would it be like a, an agent that you have, so like an antivirus, that looks at everything you do? Well, that would be a, that would recognize the yeah. Because it knows everything about you and yeah. Yeah. all your friends posts. Uh, so, um, there are actually, I think that was in 2014, 2015, there was a plugin that was developed uh, by a team of um, academic researchers that looked at uh, websites like CNN, CBS, um, and they categorized websites beforehand, like uh, Republican, uh, Conservative, or Democrats. And when people consume news, there was, there was a visual alert that uh, well, they were consuming too much of that and, and it could change their behaviors. That may be something like it, but mm. you see that was very marginal, that was only an experiment. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, that, that could be possible, provided that you have information on the content that is being consumed, which is the big problem. Once you have done it, can you create an alert that show you that the previous alert is not pushing you in another way? It's <laughs> 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 yeah, I have a headache right now. So <laughs> you had a question. No, in fact, it's not related to, to that. Because somehow it's not that you are really close to just the same content every time. When, once you go to, I, I feel like it works like this, but I'm not sure. If I go to Google and I look so, for something new, mm -hmm. then it comes to Facebook. And then it begins. So if you are educated, but it's the point that you say it's about education, mm -hmm. if you just have negative content about Brexit or for the no, and you go to Google and you look for the yes, maybe you begin to enrich your yeah. content with the uh, Perhaps. Well, I doubt that if you only uh, use uh, Google that you will be able to achieve that. Um, the experiment that you can do for yourself is to use different brothers. Uh, so I use Quant. Uh, I use DuckDuckGo. I don't know whether you know uh, those brothers. And you use Google and then you try what you are describing. So when you are searching something, you, you type in your different brothers and you, or different uh, search engines. Um, and you just look for yourself which kind of results you, you get, and that's just astonishing. You will, <laughs> you will never get the first, uh, the same 10 first results on Google and on Quant or on uh, DuckDuckGo. 
So no, that, that I know, but I, I have remarked that sometimes you, you look for something new, even if it's not for you, it's for like a, a friend on your yeah. Google, and then like content is coming to you, but even on Facebook, yeah. I think so. It's possible or not? Yes, it's possible. Yeah, but they but, uh, are. Oh, yeah, of course. They, they, they well, can have both. Uh, obviously, but that's what, yeah. that's what we call the third-party cookies. Um, so uh, I don't know whether anyone is uh, familiar with third-party cookies and uh, data management platforms, DMPs. Uh, but that's the, what what you uh, describe is actually the same phenomenon as uh, when you uh, look online for buying uh, flight, and then you get uh, recommendations on hotels and. Actually, the, the information that you search for something is stored in a third-party cookie and shared with many others. Uh, this is something that you observe when you... Uh, oh, that's something which is really disturbing. I, uh, I used to um, communicate with many new peoples yeah, through my world because I met many new peoples uh, every week. And when I send an email, for instance, uh, to someone new, suddenly... In my Facebook feed, I see you, you could add that person. Yeah, and then you would yeah, yeah. you? How the fuck you know that? How was interacting with that people? Well, actually, they, they just steal your data, and the process that you're discovering is exactly the same. So that third-party data cookie is, uh, is the way to get access to everything what, uh, what you do. Wow, that's disturbing. And even when you add something on LinkedIn, that person shows up on Facebook yeah, as a recommendation. Obviously, yeah. obviously, they do that. But the problem now here is in the invasion. Is uh, people that are connected to Facebook, they mm -hmm. can no longer look at Facebook. So I don't really like this this uh, action against Facebook because now we're cut off. So it's, it's, it's a test, I think. So yeah, in Belgium, we are cut off. Because the government wants, wants to do good. Yeah. Because of the do good, we are not the people that are not choosing Facebook. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's. Uh, well, I, there is nothing I can do against that. Yeah, but the government could say, like, okay, you go to Facebook, and we allow you to go on Facebook, but uh, it's, it's no longer possible. You know, you are, I mean, if you want to go on Facebook, you can, you can do that. My only uh, point yeah, is that... I have to use, like, a, uh, uh, like the product site, and I'm not good with that. Okay. I can do it with the other one. Tor. Tor, yeah. Mm. If you start to go on Facebook, you are on the version, so... Sucks. Yeah, Crazy. if you are not registered. Yeah. If you are not registered, obviously. But I mean, if you, even if you are registered and you come on my websites, there, there are ways that we are right now implementing to protect you. Uh, you know, the, um, there was a try on ours. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit too, too technical right now, but there was a try on ours a mechanism that was put into place by Facebook to collect information on all your behaviors as soon as there was a like button on a, on a web page. Yeah, I, I don't care if they, they get Oh, you don't care, okay. Okay, but then, then you should not go on tour. Then you just register, you surf, and then that's okay. You do. No, no, I don't want to register. Oh, you don't want to register? I don't want to register to Facebook, and I want to, to because every event is like a Facebook, Facebook page. Yeah. So I want to, to look at the event and the event because I don't want to register so it's because of the law. Yeah, but, well, unfortunately, this, this I cannot solve. Yeah. I can only yeah, solve. Like, like an organization like you all wants to do yeah. I don't know whether it will have a negative effect. Perhaps in the beginning, because people uh, will not come from Facebook anymore. But do I, as an organization which has no financial uh, KPIs, care about it? I don't know. You, as a taxpayer, you are financing my uh, my project. I don't care about whether uh, I have fifteen percent traffic less. No, but the government uh, makes rules to say that. And you do not like to register. So that's that's an unsolved problem. I, I, there is nothing I can do for you. I, yeah. I have a question. It's that uh, we are here at the ICAB. So ICAB it's uh, the innovation of, of business and stuff like this. We are at the Vier uh, Hackathon. And so you have here 20 person uh, who will uh, develop amazing stuff in the future. And what would be your point uh, about this discussion? What uh, would you us to do? What would you uh, us to not do in the future? 
there was one thing that I would like you to, to develop, guys, is to make exploration easier. Yeah? Uh, because from a, from a behavioral perspective, what we observe is that people tend to stick to their habits. And what we're trying to do is to make people escape their habits, which are sometimes negative for them. So if you can find ways through virtual reality to uh, facilitate, to make that exploration easier, exploration of content, but exploration of other places, of whatever, just to open the minds of people, that would be great. Yeah? Because that's what we need as a society. We need people who have open minds. We need people who um, do not want to live in ghettos, who do not um, who like to embrace other races, uh, who are not afraid of other religions. That's what we need. So if we, through virtual reality, can um, make people uh, enjoy again uh, the differences that makes actually our world and our society and our lives richer, then I think we're on a good way. Yeah? Make sense? Thank you. Thank you so much.